Okay, I'm gonna get started. Hi, my name is Charlotte. I'm a graduate student in the lab of Drapanagalu in the neurology department, and I'd like to welcome you to this week's Columbia Neuroscience Seminar featuring Dr. Francisco Quintana presenting on the role of astrocytes in CNS inflammation. Dr. Quintana will be giving his talk live and we'll take all questions at the end. During the talk, feel free to ask questions using the Q&A box. You can ask your question anonymously if you prefer. If you're a trainee, please add the word trainee before your question so that we can prioritize it. Um, people can also upvote questions they see in the Q&A box. Um, you are able to enable live closed captioning or transcript by clicking live transcript at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and there'll be a chance to mingle at 2 p.m. with Dr. Quintana in a separate Zoom meeting. The specific link will be posted there toward the end of the seminar. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Francisco Quintana, who joins us today from Brigham and Women's Hospital at Harvard Medical School, where he's an associate profe professor of neurology at the Center for Neurologic Diseases, as well as an associate member at the Broad Institute. After graduating from the University of Buenos Aires, Dr. Quintana completed his PhD in immunology at the Weizmann Institute of Science in the lab of Dr. Irun Cohen. He then received postdoctoral training at Harvard Medical School with Dr. Howard Weiner. In 2009, he joined the faculty at Harvard where his lab is focused on understanding signaling pathways that control autoimmunity and neurodegeneration. Among his many contributions, he has investigated glial immune cell crosstalk in CNS inflammation and has identified important roles for the transcription factor aryl hydrocarbon receptor in multiple sclerosis, glioblastoma, and viral infection. His seminar today is titled The Role of Astrocytes in CNS Inflammation. And with that, uh, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Madonna. Thanks a lot for the nice introduction and, and thanks for to the organizers actually for having me here. It's actually a great honor. Um, so what I'm going to do today is actually to, to talk or discuss our work on the role of um, astrocytes in CNS inflammation, in CNS pathology. And in particular, our work is centered around uh, one specific disease and each animal model. In particular, we work mostly on multiple sclerosis and uh, experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis is animal model. Yet uh, we extend our work to other conditions as it was mentioned before, such as brain tumors and brain targeting viral infection. When we think about multiple sclerosis, right? What we think is about autoimmune T cells, making it into the CNS where they are reactivated and they're causing damage to axons and myelin. And indeed, uh, that has been shown to be a central mechanism of disease pathogenesis in multiple sclerosis. And this is a mechanism for which we now have multiple therapeutic interventions. However, as those T cells make it into the CNS, those cells are also going to activate other types of immunity. In this case, they are going to trigger pro-inflammatory responses driven by CNS resident microglia and astrocytes. And that's extremely important because this um, is going to trigger an independent type or a different type of inflammation, an inflammation and inflammatory response that is going to promote new degeneration through multiple mechanisms. And most importantly, a type of inflammation and new degeneration for which we have really limited therapeutic approaches available. And indeed, we and others believe that some of these mechanisms of disease pathogenesis are going to be shared by other uh, neurologic diseases, hence identifying what regulates them and identifying candidate targets for therapeutic intervention is likely to result in therapeutic agents that are relevant not only for progressive phases of MS, for new degenerative stages of multiple sclerosis, but also for other new degenerative diseases. So with that in mind, my lab has focused mostly in trying to identify the mechanisms by which astrocytes contribute to CNS pathology and how those mechanisms are regulated. Um, when we think about astrocytes in health, their role has been known for years. They're important for CNS development, for the function and development of the blood-brain barrier of synapses in under homeostatic conditions, right? Astrocytes provide nutrients. 
They provide neurotrophic factors important for uh, neural function. But many of these functions are actually going to be uh, depressed or, or not present uh, in the context of pathology. On top of that, in the context of neurologic diseases, astrocytes might gain other functions that directly contribute to this pathogenesis. And we can think, for example, about the ability to recruit monocytes to the central nervous system via, for example, the production of chemokines such as CCL2. Also, astrocytes have been shown to secrete factors that can activate CNS resident myeloid cells, for example, microglia. And astrocytes themselves, they can uh, and they are known to be endowed with endogenous neurotoxic activity. So then the question is, what are the different uh, mechanisms that regulate these uh, depressed functions, the depressed homeostatic functions, and also that boost those pathologic functions in the context of uh, neurologic diseases? And in order to address that question, there are two points that I want to bring up, two points that are going to be very important for what I want to share with you today. The first point is that more than 100 years ago, Santiago Ramón y Cajal, he actually uh, was able to differentiate multiple types of astrocytes, at least based on uh, their morphology. Hence, one of the questions we would try to address is which of these subsets uh, are pro, are, are, are actually benefit uh, or try to uh, drive disease pro progression as opposite to trying to arrest it. And the second thing that we will try to address is how many of these functions and how is it that each one of these astrocyte subsets is controlled and regulated by cell cell interactions. Because another finding from Ramon y Cajal was the fact that astrocytes are highly interconnected among themselves, but also with other cells within the central nervous system. So with that in mind, the goal of my lab was, or one of our goals was actually to start to characterize astrocyte heterogeneity and try to, uh, and try to assign function to, this, to different uh, astrocyte subsets. In order to do so, we actually analyzed uh, not only preclinical samples, uh, samples coming from multiple uh, models of experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis, but also clinical samples from uh, um, freshly, uh, recently deceased patients. And we subjected those samples to single cell and back analysis, ranging from transcriptomic to proteomic. And the idea or the goal of our studies was first to define different astrocyte subsets, then to identify for each one of them uh, transcriptional regulators that would be central to their function. And the goal of that was actually to be able to perform in vivo cell-specific gene perturbation studies, in particular using CRISPR, as a way of trying to infer the function of each one of these different astrocyte subsets. And with that in mind, and with that kind of framework in, framework in mind, I'm going to share with you two examples that actually represent and highlight the breadth of astrocyte responses and functions in the context of CNS pathology. And the first example I want to share with you is actually a subset of astrocytes we identified, which are driven by the transcription factor MAFG. And the point I want to make as, as I move through my presentation is that I'm going to use the word subset in order to define these clusters or groups or types of astrocytes, because it is not clear to us yet which one of these subsets is actually uh, developmentally uh, encoded and which one is just an activation state that can revert or be changed into a different state in the presence of different stimuli. Though I'm going to share with you some of our early findings in terms of the plasticity of different astrocyte subsets. So having said that, as I mentioned, the first example I wanted to share with you was this a subset of mass driven pathogenic astrocytes. And we identified these astrocytes as a result uh, of the analysis by single cell RNA-seq of clinical samples and, and from MS patients and controls, and also samples obtained from EIE mice. And as you can see here, our studies detected, identified the 
significant expansion of what we call here cluster one astrocytes. A subset of astrocytes that was significantly expanded, both in the cerebellum and the cortex. That was interesting. Indeed, that was observed when we independently analyzed three different uh, MS and control sample data sets. So hence the question we wanted to address was to start to try to uh, investigate a little bit about the function of these different astrocytes astrocytes that were expanded or more abundant in MS samples. In order to do so, so we went over the uh, transcriptional profile of those astrocytes. The first thing we noticed was a significant uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, a significant impairment of the ability of astrocytes to provide lactate via the lactate, the, uh, lactate shuttle to support the metabolic needs of neurons. And this is very important because Years back, Pellerin and Magistretti, they reported that actually astrocytes support the metabolic needs of neurons, and they do so via a specific lactate shuttle. And indeed, a few years back, our lab actually established how that mechanism is significantly disrupted in the context of MS. What our findings here suggest is that this specific cluster really shows a significant um, decrease or impairment in the ability, in its ability to perform one of the basic functions performed by astrocytes in the context of CNS physiology. Second observation we made is that actually there was a significant activation of the unfolded protein response in astrocytes. And indeed, that recapitulated a, a finding made a few years back by uh, uh, Mark Wheeler in the lab, where he showed the significant activation of the unfolded protein response leading to the uh, generation of an active transcription factor, XBP1, was actually involved in promoting some of the pathogenic ac activities of astrocytes. And indeed, that does, this one does not seem to be an observation relevant only to multiple sclerosis, because a year after Mike published his paper, there was an independent publication suggesting that the UPR could also uh, promote the disease-promoting activities of astrocytes in the context of prion-induced neurodegeneration. So, so far, so good. But then one interesting observation we made was that when we analyzed the candidate or when we searched for the candidate regulators of this astrocyte subset, we detected a significant uh, role for a transcription factor called MAFG, which is one of the small members of the MAF family of transcription factors. And in particular, MAFG has been shown to, um, has been reported to play an important role in the control of the epigenetic status of multiple cell types. So the first experiment we performed was actually to CRISPR inactivate MAFG specifically in astrocytes. And as you can see here, when we do so, we see a significant, we detect a significant amelioration of EIE, a significant decrease in CNS inflammation and neurodegeneration, suggesting that MAFG and indeed this MAFG driven astrocyte subset somehow promotes CNS pathology. We then investigated uh, a little bit more the mechanisms used by MAFG to control this specific astrocyte subset. And as I mentioned, MAFG, uh, it's known to be an epigenetic modifier. So we actually uh, analyzed the methylome of these astrocytes in which we had um, inactivated or not MAFG via CRISPR. And as you can see here, MAFG has a significant effect on the methylation status of uh, astrocyte of this specific astrocyte cluster. And in particular, many of those genes reported and shown in our data to be regulated by MAFG are known to, very, to play very important roles in CNS homeostasis. And for example, I'm highlighting uh, here this gene NRF2, uh, this gene NFE2L2, uh, which actually codes for a protein called NRF2. And this is an important protein because this is a protein that is activated by a drug already in use in MS. It's, it's, a, it's actually the drug activated by, it's a gene activated by fumarates. And this is a very important gene for the ability of astrocytes 
to limit uh, um, oxidative stress in the CNS. So hence, they could, this would be another example of an homeostatic function uh, of astrocyte that is inactivated or impaired in the context of CNS pathology. And finally, as I mentioned, MAFG is a small member of the MAF family of transcription factors. It doesn't operate alone in order to control the uh, methylation status of, of multiple cell types. It does so by interacting with three, with one of three cofactors, either mat 2 8 BAG1, or BAG2. So in order to determine which one of them was actually contributing or participating with MAFG in the control of astrocyte responses, we CRISPR out each one of them and then investigated or evaluated the development of EIE. And as you can see here, when we inactivated BAG1 or BAG2, there was no significant effect on EIE development, yet when we inactivated MAD2, we uh, observed a phenotype that really closely resembled the one uh, that we obtained when we CRISPR'd out MAFG. These and additional in vitro and in vivo experiments determined that MAFG and MAD2A cooperate in order to control the epigenetic status of these specific astrocyte subset. The last observation we made with regards with these specific astrocyte subset was that there was a significant uh, signature associated with GMCSF signaling. And that's a very important point because as you may know, GMCSF is a cytokine that has been associated with highly pathogenic T cells in the context of multiple sclerosis and other autoimmune diseases. Indeed, uh, there's work coming from the labs of Rostami, the lab of Becker and the lab of, of BJ Kushu which have shown that GMCSF is very important for the development of T-cell-driven autoimmunity. However, when we read about the potential mechanisms by which GMCSF contributes to pathology, this is mostly thought to act on myeloid cells. There's no real reports of, or at the time, there were no real reports of GMCSF acting on astrocytes. So in order to address and investigate that point, we performed a very simple experiment we generated a conditional knockout mice in which the GMCSF receptor was specifically inactivated in astrocytes. And as you can see here, GMCSF, the inactivation of GMCSF signaling specifically in astrocytes resulted in a significant amelioration of EIE and a significant decrease of the transcriptional signature associated to this MAFG driven astrocyte. Most interestingly, when we analyzed by in cytotranscriptomics, the location of MAT2A uh, MAFG positive astrocyte with regards to or, or in, in relationship to the location, the localization of uh, T cells producing GMCSF, those cells were shown to be very closely correlated, suggesting that indeed within the CNS, GMCSF produced by um, T cells plays an important role in the control of MAFG driven astrocyte responses. And with that, I want to finalize the first part of my talk. So basically, I wanted to share with you some of our data on the role of MAFG positive astrocytes in CNS pathogenesis. These are astrocytes that show significant impaired, impaired ability to support the metabolic needs of neurons and also to control oxidative stress. These astrocytes showed an impaired, uh, show an exacerbated and faulty protein response. And one important point I want to make is that they seem to be maintained or induced via GMCSF produced by a specific subset of T cells. Now, the example I want to share with you is actually at the other end of the spectrum. And it's actually a subset of astrocytes characterized by the surface expression of the, of the apoptosis inducing molecule trail. And we identify this molecule uh, or, or this astrocyte subset as part of our studies in which we performed uh, proteomic analysis of different astrocyte subsets. These studies, in combination with single cell RNA-seq, identify a specific subset of astrocytes characterized by the expression of LAMP1 and the uh, proapoptotic molecule trail. We then uh, followed an approach similar to the one I mentioned before. We actually then first um, uh, inactivated trails specifically in astrocytes and, and investigated 
the development of EIE. As you can see here, when we inactivated trail expression via CRISPR, specifically in astrocytes, there was a significant worsening of EIE, suggesting that somehow these trail positive astrocytes limit uh, CNS pathology and inflammation. And, and a hint about the mechanism involved came when we actually analyzed uh, the apoptosis of T cells within the central nervous system. And the reason we did so is because trail is known to be very important to induce T cell apoptosis. When we performed those studies, we detected that the uh, inactivation of trail in astrocytes and concomitant worsening of EIE was associated with a significant decrease of T cell apoptosis in the CNN. So that led us to think that actually these astrocytes that express trail in the membrane might be limiting CNS inflammation by inducing apoptosis of uh, pro-inflammatory T cells as they try to make it into the CNS. And indeed, in multiple in vitro and in vivo experiments, we were able to demonstrate that these trail positive astrocytes indeed induce the apoptosis of highly pathogenic pro-inflammatory T cells. So, so far, so good. The second question we wanted to address was, what were, what were the mechanisms regulating uh, these trail positive astrocytes? In order to address that question, we actually performed additional single cell RNA-6 studies. And to our surprise, one of the strongest signatures we detected in these trail positive anti-inflammatory astrocytes was interferon gamma signaling. And that's important because interferon gamma surprisingly has been shown for years, actually more than 20 years ago, to, be, to play very strongly, a very uh, important uh, protective role in the context of EIE. And that has been shown when either interferon gamma has been deleted or its a receptor uh, has been deleted as well. The question was, was, what was the mechanism involved in those protective effects of interferon gamma and how these trail positive anti-inflammatory astrocytes could fit into these effects. So in order to address that, the first thing we did was actually to treat astrocytes in vitro with interferon gamma and also with other cytokines. As you can see here, interferon gamma induces a very strong upregulation of trail expression. This upregulation is not a seen if we use type one interference like interferon beta, or if you use other pro or anti-inflammatory cytokines. The important thing though, was that if we actually take these trail positive astrocytes, right? And then we treat them with GMCSF, which a few minutes ago told you and showed you induces a very pro-inflammatory uh, uh, subset of astrocytes. Or if we treat these astrocytes with TNF, I1 alpha and C1Q, which Lidolo and co-workers showed uh, can also induce a pathogenic subset of astrocytes. Both treatments were able to result in a significant reduction of trail expression in astrocytes. And indeed, we were able to mimic some of those studies in vitro, suggesting that these anti-inflammatory interferon gamma driven astrocyte subset could actually be reversible and could actually be abrogated or suppressed in the context of strong inflammatory responses even provided by, or inflammatory signals provided by either T cells such as TMCSF or CNS resident microglia such as TNF, um, uh, I1, alpha and C1Q. So with that in mind, we investigated in vivo the role of interferon gamma signaling in astrocytes and as you can see here, if we inactivate um, STAT1, uh, the receptors involved in interferon gamma signaling, or STAT1, which comes just underneath, there's a significant um, worsening of EIE, suggesting that indeed uh, interferon gamma signaling in astrocytes is anti inflammatory in the context of EIE. Moreover, if we analyze in these mice the expression of trail, when we inactivate interferon gamma signaling, there's a significant decrease in trail expression, and that goes along with a significant decrease in uh, T cell apoptosis in the CNS. Taken together, these findings suggest that interferon gamma in astrocytes 
or, or interferon gamma is at least one of these uh, signals that induces trail expression in astrocytes. So with that, the question we wanted to address was what is the source of interferon gamma in astrocytes, uh, in particular in the naive CNS. And this is an important point I wanna make. There's very little, if anything at all, infiltration of the CNS parenchyma, but uh, by, in, in, by uh, peripheral immune cells in naive mice. However, the meninges is, is all the time, is, is, is constantly patrolled by immune cells. And indeed it has been shown that astrocytes can actually sense molecules present in, 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 in the meninges. So we hypothesized that potentially there were interferon gamma sources in the meninges that were actually inducing trail expression. That was actually supported by the fact that these trail expressing astrocytes were really detected mostly underneath the meninges. So with that in mind, we use interferon gamma reporter mice and we basically quantify the different cell subsets and the production of interferon gamma by different cell subsets. We detected a significant uh, production of interferon gamma by NK cells, uh, although we also detected some T cells and ILC1 cells producing it, suggesting that indeed it was indeed uh, NK cells were the main source of interferon gamma in the naive CNS. Then to investigate whether they would have these NK cells would have any relevance for the control of trail expression in astrocytes, we actually treated these mice with a NK cell depleting antibodies. And as you can see, that treatment resulted in a significant decrease in the number of NK cells uh, in the meninges. And that was associated with a significant decrease in the frequency of trail positive astrocytes uh, in, uh, in the CNS. Conversely, if we, now, if we now take astrocytes and co-incubate them with NK cells that are either expressing or not interferon gamma, because we can use either knockout mice or uh, interferon gamma reporter NK cells, co-incubation of astrocytes with NK cells that express interferon gamma results in a significant uh, upregulation of trail expression. Taken together, these findings suggest that NK cells are one of the relevant sources of interferon gamma, which is involved in the induction of trail, trail expression in this anti-inflammatory astrocyte subset. The final question we wanted to address was, how is it that interferon gamma was regulated in NK cells in the meninges? That was not clear to us. Yet, when we started to go over the literature, in particular literature associated with cancer immunology, it was shown that the intestinal microbiome is able and is a strong inducer of interferon gamma expression in NK cells. So then we first asked whether the intestinal microbiome could potentially be regulating uh, trail expression in astrocytes via the regulation of interferon gamma in NK cells. If we actually quantify NK cells and interferon gamma producing NK cells in germ-free and SPF mice, as you can see here, there's really no significant difference in the total number of NK cells that circulate through the meninges in germ-free or SPF mice. However, in, from within those uh, NK cells, there's a significant difference in the frequency of which of those cells expresses interferon gamma. In other words, germ-free germ mice have the same meningeal uh, NK cell numbers, but those NK cells have a reduced expression of interferon gamma. And that is also reflected as a reduced abundance of trail producing astrocytes in germ-free mice. So this data suggested, yet didn't prove, that NK cells somehow induced to produce interferon gamma by the commensal flora can reach the CNS and there induce the expression of trail in astrocytes. In order to prove that and to further investigate that point, what we did was to actually use uh, mice that can be photoactivated and hence in which we can uh, turn the expression, turn on the expression of a red reporter. 
So with those mice, what we did was we illuminated the gut of these mice, and then 24 hour, hour late, hours later, we look for the detection of NK cells that show this red uh, transgenic mark in the meninges, suggesting that the cells are circulating. So as you can see here, when we perform this experiment, we detect a significant number of NK cells that migrated from the gut to the meninges 24 hours after gut irradiation, like irradiation. And the important point I wanna make is that if these mice were naive in the sense that we didn't induce EIE or any type of CNS inflammatory conditions, these NK cells, they remained in the, in the meninges. They did not infiltrate the parenchyma. In a second experiment, we repeated this approach, but now treated the mice with um, uh, antibiotics in order to significantly decrease the commensal flora. And as you can see, when we do that, we detect a significant decrease in interferon gamma production by those circulating NK cells, suggesting that the gut flora in educates or induces interferon gamma production in NK cells that circulate through the body. And when they go in particular through the meninges can induce this anti-inflammatory trail expressing uh, astrocyte phenotype. So with that, just to summarize what I showed you uh, today. So these data suggest that there's an anti-inflammatory subset of astrocytes, which is that is driven, that induces T cell apoptosis uh, through a mechanism mediated by trail. This anti-inflammatory astrocyte subset is induced by interferon gamma we believe one of the main sources of that interferon gamma is actually NK cells that are educated in the gut by the gut flora. So this finding has very important implications. First of all, it adds another mechanism or another degree of complexity to the different mechanisms by which the gut flora can control CNS resident cells, uh, in particular astrocytes. We have shown a few years back that actually there are some commensal flora metabolism, uh, metabolites, right? That just because of their chemical properties can reach the CNS and control astrocytes microglia and their crosstalk. The data I, present you to the, I presented you today suggests that the gut flora can also educate or, or modulate the function of NK cells or other immune cells in the gut that can then reach the CNS and they are, interact with astrocytes in order to also control uh, astrocyte responses. And one implication of these findings is that we can start to think about engineered uh, probiotics in order to target this gut-brain axis as a way of controlling the pathogenic activities of astrocytes and other CNS resident cells. And indeed, we recently uh, described one of these efforts where we generated therapeutic engineered probiotics that can sense and, and, and respond to inflammation. And we're actually working on additional uh, circuits and engineered probiotics to directly modulate gut, the gut brain axis. Now, if we uh, go back to our initial, initial question, right, or discussion about different astrocyte subsets, what I shared with you was a different astrocyte subset characterized by the expression of trail, which has an anti-inflammatory role, and it basically does so by inducing T cell apoptosis. And the interesting thing I wanted to mention is that this is this astrocyte subset is actually induced by NK by a specific subset of uh, NK cells that produce interferon gamma. So when we think, you know, a little bit about the data I showed you. I talked about different astrocyte subsets of phenotypes and how is it that they are controlled by multiple uh, interactions with different uh, subsets, either via GMCSF, via interferon gamma. If we step back, that's a common mechanism of regulation of astrocytes. Microglia astrocyte crosstalk is known to play a very important role in astrocyte regulation. Uh, Shane Lidlow talked about or described a role for I1-alpha, C1-Q, and TNF-alpha in regulating uh, uh, astrocytic responses. We showed previously how VGFD and TGF-alpha produced by microglia can also control astrocytic responses. 
We and others have talked about this very deep cross communication between neurons, astrocytes, and oligodendrocytes, which involves not only chemokines and cytokines, but also specific metabolites in order to regulate the activity of these many cell types. And finally, today we discussed about the role of astrocytes, T cell and NK cell communication in order to control astrocyte subsets and their responses. The real question then is how can we investigate uh, multiple astrocyte, uh, multiple cell-cell interactions that control the responses of astrocytes and potentially other cells in the central nervous system. In order to address that, we develop a technique which we call uh, RabbitSick, which is basically based on, um, on uh, using a barcode that is delivered to interacting cells in the CNS via a modified rabies virus. And that's important because this barcode allows us to basically identify which cells interact in vivo, which are the mechanisms involved and potentially which are candidate uh, therapeutic targets in order to modulate those cell-cell interactions. We first applied or implementing this, implemented this new approach uh, for the analysis of CNS cell-cell interactions in the context of EIE. And the first piece of data you get from this analysis is a classic single cell uh, RNA-seq uh, TISNI or UMAP plot, where obviously each cell, uh, each point represents a single cell. The important difference with your classic single cell RNA-seq studies is that each one of these points is annotated with a barcode that allows us to establish cell-cell interaction. And that allows us to turn these UMAP and TISNI plots into something like this, where cells and interacting cells can be identified. And although these, these, these plots look extremely complex, at the very base of them, you can identify interacting cells, which can be assigned to a different cell type or cell subset based on the transcriptional profiles, and which you can investigate in detail in order to establish mechanisms or candidate mechanisms of cell-cell interactions. When we applied this to uh, EIE, we were able to identify, first of all, different cell-cell interactions in the context of EIE. Obviously, uh, once you induce inflammation, astrocytes interact with additional cells besides astrocytes and microglia. And most importantly, these studies allowed us to identify specific interactions involving uh, subsets of astrocytes of interest. When we did so, the first thing we wanted to do was to first, uh, was to validate pre-existing uh, findings. And for example, we were able to demonstrate as it was reported before that rabbit sick could detect microglia astrocyte interactions mediated by BGF, B secreted by microglia acting on astrocytes via the FLT1 receptor. We were also able to validate our previous findings on how an anti-inflammatory state in astrocytes was induced by IL-10 produced by a specific subset of regulatory T cells called TR1 cells. So far, so good. So what is it that we can learn? In order to actually focus on, on, on a specific question, what we decided to do was to identify, based on the transcriptional profile, the most pro-inflammatory astrocyte subset and from that, do a reverse engineering approach and identify the microglia that interact with them. And in particular, the interactions mediating microglia astrocyte interactions between those very pro-inflammatory astrocyte subsets and their activating microglia. When we perform those analyses, to our surprise, the best, the top, the highest ranked uh, type of interaction or pathway was actually those interactions mediated by axon signaling, by axon guidance uh, pathways, and in particular interactions mediated by a signaling system involving the F receptor and its ligand, efferin, the efferin protein. In particular, our studies identified the FP3 receptor expressed in astrocytes uh, as being an important mediator of pro-inflammatory responses at this time, at this time just candidate pro-inflammatory responses triggered by its ligand, efferin B3. And there are a few points I wanna make. In this case, 
both FB3 and its ligand Ephraim B3 are membrane bound. So that's important because then both interacting cells have to be extremely close. The second point I want to make is that both interacting cells uh, or express proteins with uh, intracellular signaling domain. The FB3 uh, uh, receptor has a, an important signaling domain, which expresses a tyrosine kinase, which harbors a tyrosine kinase, and hence uh, it's itself a very interesting candidate for therapeutic intervention. But the Ephraim B3 intracellular domain can also trigger intracellular, intracellular signaling. So hence you have a system where interacting cells can both modify their cellular responses as a result of bidirectional signaling. The first uh, experiment we performed in order to validate with these findings was actually to analyze a CNS a tissue from MS patients. And as you can see here, we detected a significant upregulation of the FB3 receptor in astrocytes and the Ephraim B3 uh, ligand in microglia from MS patients. We validated that also when we reanalyzed our single cell RNA seq data set. We then went on and actually analyzed functionally or evaluated functionally these studies in perturbation, these findings in perturbation studies. And as you can see here, if we inactivate the FB3 receptor in, in, in astrocytes or the Ephraim B3 ligand in microglia, that results in a significant uh, amelioration of EIE, uh, concomitant with a significant decrease in the recruitment of inflammatory monocytes into the CNS and a significant decrease in pro-inflammatory responses in astrocytes. If we now analyze the effect of that downstream signaling pathway, particularly in astrocytes, what we found is that actually FB3 signaling in astrocytes controls uh, mTOR function, and by doing so, controls microglial activity. And that's important because eventually those mechanisms regulate the production of mitochondrial reactive oxygen species that activate a series of uh, pro-inflammatory responses. As I mentioned, um, uh, this uh, signaling pathway is actually bidirectional and also is going to trigger signaling in microglia. If we now analyze microglia, when we inactivate either Ephraim B3 signaling in microglia or FB3, if we, if we deplete it in astrocytes, that results in a significant down regulation of microglial activation. And indeed, a series of molecular studies determined that Ephraim B3 signaling in microglia boost in NF-kappa B activation, and by doing so, boost the activation of NF-kappa B driven transcriptional responses that promote CNS inflammation and pathology. As I mentioned, these, uh, the intracellular domain of FB3 is actually tyrosine kinase. So we performed uh, a small, uh, we perform actually a small molecule uh, screening uh, campaign in order to identify small molecules that would be brain penetrant and would be able to interfere and inhibit the tyrosine kinase activity of FB3. We identify such a molecule. And as you can see here, that is, has the ability to significantly suppress FB3 kinase activity. And when administered to mice, either in this model or additional models of uh, MS, we uh, observed a significant suppression of EIE associated with a significant suppression of astrocyte and microglia pro-inflammatory responses. A significant, a small point I want to make, we believe that A38 acts directly in astrocytes in suppressing the pro-inflammatory responses by interfering with FB3 signaling and interferes with the pro-inflammatory responses of microglia indirectly by inhibiting the production of cytokines produced by astrocytes that activate uh, microglia. And that's something I can talk about later. And finally, going back to our analysis, uh, the second set of molecules that we identified mediating these interactions between astrocytes and microglia are semaphorins. 
semaphorin in particular, semaphorin uh, uh, 4D expressed in microglia interacting with plexin B2 and plexin B1 in astrocyte. This, uh, when inactivated, these interactions also resulted in a significant amelioration of EIE. And the interesting point I want to make is that because of their location, right, when we validated these findings in MS patients, these semaphorin mediated interactions seem to involve different subsets of astrocytes than those mediated by efferin, suggesting that the mechanisms used by even by the very same cells, cell types, right, astrocytes and microglia, to crosstalk and potentiate the pro-inflammatory disease-promoting activities can change in different areas of the CNA. And with that, I want to finish. First of all, I want to say, you know, just to uh, mention, we developed this method which we called rabbit sick, which is a new way or allows the study of cell-cell interactions in vivo. I show you data here today on how we can use it for the study of CNS cell interactions in transgenic mice. We, got, we have actually evolved this method already. So now we, got, we have applied it for uh, two uh, living non-human primates in order to study, for example, the process of aging. And we have also used it to study um, tissue samples from humans, for example, we have a very advanced program on using this technique to study the tumor, the tumor microenvironment in the context of glioblastoma. Second, these studies, if you remember, uh, efferin and FD3, these are membrane-bound proteins, suggesting that there should be very close interactions between astrocytes and microglia in the context of interaction of MS. And this is actually how we validated some of those interactions by um, uh, electron microscopy. And obviously, this uh, begs the question of what are other molecules that could be mediating those interactions, and this is something we're very interested in. And finally, um, these studies led us to identify at least two uh, pathways mediating astrocyte microglia interactions, uh, pathways that seem to be reactivated, uh, pathways associated with development that seems to be reactivated in the context of inflammation. And in particular, one of those pathways, FRIM-B3 and FB3, seems to offer uh, candidate targets for therapeutic intervention. With that in mind, uh, I want to acknowledge, uh, just to finish uh, where we started, what I wanted to do with you was to discuss uh, and go back to the idea that there are different subsets of astrocytes performing multiple roles in health and disease. And, and the question is, what are those subsets? How are they controlled? And in particular, what is the role of cells and interactions in controlling those different cell subsets and functions. And with that, I will finish by acknowledging those that performed those studies, Mike Wheeler, Cristina Gutierrez Vasquez, Ian Clark, and Liana San Marco. Thanks, and I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Dr. Quintana, for a really fantastic talk spanning a lot of different projects. Um, We'll start out with some trainee questions. Um, we have two from Mary Claire Tui. She asks, um, uh, is the interferon gamma production by NK cells uh, unique to astrocytes or is it having an effect on inflammation in other CNS cells? Oh, that's an excellent question. Indeed, in the, in the supplementary data, we showed that there's a significant upregulation of trail expression in microglia as well. Um, we didn't investigate that in detail because we focused on astrocyte-specific inactivation studies. Yet when we step back, right, and you consider the effects of pathology, it is likely that the effect of microglia uh, might also play a role. She also wonders um, whether the effect of MAFG um, is cell autonomous in astrocytes um, or are you observing other downstream changes like decreased immune cell infiltration? So that's a good point. I mean, like the MAFG acts uh, on astrocytes, right? Because the, the experiments I showed you were specific gene activation studies in astrocytes. However, some of the transcriptional programs controlled uh, by MAFG in astrocytes are going to uh, impact 
the responses of other cells in the CNS, such as, for example, monocytes and microglia. Um, a question from an anonymous trainee asks, how was it originally determined that T cells are increased in the CNS in neurodegenerative disease? Were these living or post-mortem patient samples? Um, and what kind of samples are available from patients to validate the mechanisms found in mouse models? Okay, so in many, so the fact that T cells are increased in neurodegenerative diseases, or like for example, in multiple sclerosis, that has, has been known for years now, right? By uh, immunopathology studies. And then uh, more recently when we and others were able to perform uh, RNA-seq and other analysis. That's not uh, only observed in MS, that's also observed in other more classic, uh, other diseases that are usually considered uh, neurodegenerative. Just go for Parkinson and AD. You're going to see T cells. If you look into stroke, you can also detect T cells. In other words, the recruitment of T cells to the, CNA, to the CNS is quite common in response to many types of trauma. Fantastic. Um, Jatana Galyu asks, does T cell apoptosis by LAMP1 positive trail positive astrocytes occur at cuffing sites in post-capillary venules? We didn't map it that well. That's a very good question of where specifically it occurs. Um, Hanane Tuil, a postdoc in uh, Phil Dieger's lab, says amazing talk um, and asks if the rabbit seek and, um, assesses cell-cell interaction via soluble factors, um, such as meningeal immune cells affecting glial cells in the context of MS. So we have, um, so in the data I showed you, I showed you interactions by soluble factors that had been previously shown and we recapitulated them. So in our paper, we showed IL-10, you know, acting, produced by T cells, acting on astrocytes and microglia. That's something we have shown a couple of times, last time, uh, a few months ago. Then we also recapitulated soluble factors uh, mediated interactions between CNS resident cells, such as microglia and astrocytes. Uh, but we use that data as a way of validated previous findings, right? And we focus on these novel uh, interactions via FB3 and FMB3. The additional interactions and factors that were going on in valid, we're following up in validation studies as we speak. Um, Dr. Carol Troy asks, is the total number of astrocytes constant with the identity of subsets changing with disease? Um, I think this might have been in relation to the single cell data. Yeah, that's a big question. And, and you know, a related question is when you have astrogliosis, does it mean cell division or just upregulation of markers of activation such as GFAP? We believe that both, uh, both mechanisms are ongoing. So in other words, when, this, when we see an expansion of specific subset, it could be that both things are happening, that you know, there's division and then there's also polarization, if you wish. Having said that, uh, we, one of the next steps is actually to perform kind of lineage tracing studies to really be able to see uh, you know, how important is cell division, right? As a contribution to the expansion of specific subset and whether those uh, expansions or divisions result in just, you know, an amplification of the previous phenotype or, or, or something like that. But th th that's a very big, big and important question. Um, another from Jatana Galyu, um, are MAFG positive astrocytes more prominent in the spinal cord in mice since the pathology in EAE is predominantly found in the spinal cord? So that's a good point. We detected them in both and indeed Although the pathology you know, that we quantify in EIE is spinal cord pathology, you can also detect inflammatory infiltrates uh, in the brain and even the optic nerve. Um, so we detect them distributed throughout the mouse CNS and most importantly, when we go to patients, right? Uh, we detect it distributed in multiple cells, in, in multiple sites as well. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, I know that some MAT2A inhibitors are uh, in clinical trials for cancer. Um, do you think those would work in MS or is it a more specific interaction that, uh, that needs to be targeted specifically? That's a good question. I mean, that's an exciting thought. 
the question is whether that would be too unspecific, right? And the caveat is that, you know, obviously the bar is, um, you know, we are talking about cancer probably has different needs than multiple sclerosis. We're talking also about a chronic lifelong disease. So those are considerations to keep in mind. If one were uh, to able, to, one were to be able, if, if it would be possible to devise a method to the, um, to basically uh, administer or deliver the inhibitor specifically to astrocytes, that might be a good way to go. And indeed, for years, my lab has been working on nanomaterials to target different cells of the immune system. So that's an actually uh, uh, ongoing uh, and exciting project. But so far as, as we are now, right, just having a small molecule targeting it mm, might not be uh, an easy approach because I'm afraid you might have some adverse event, not justified in MS, but justified in cancer. Yes, that, that makes sense. Okay, thank you so much um, for your uh, wonderful seminar and answering those questions. If anyone else has further questions, we can roll them over to the mingling session, which uh, the link to is in um, the chat. So hope to see everyone there momentarily.